اطلب العلم اخي فهو درب به نور به ترقى به تحيا عالما حرا فخور السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته ما شاء الله Good to see you, bro. How you doing, man? How's it going, Chef? Good to see I'm you. Like Sorry, you. I've had to use someone else's phone. My phone, the 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 kind of uh, camera's cracked, and my okay. laptop screen is all black. It doesn't turn on now. Allah so man. we had we've got two technical issues, but alhamdulillah, we made it. And we, yeah, yeah, that's with it. It's about. I was just taking it on the way as I was I was driving like crazy. To, you know, this the lockdown just it slipped my mind. So I had to go here and there and then get in the house before the lockdown. And subhanAllah, just, you know, these sometimes these crazy events that we have, you know, with, with our trips. And I was just actually reminiscing our trip to, uh, in Ireland together as we traveled around. It was a difficult time. I remember the, 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 the what's going on, man. But it's fun. Alhamdulillah, we got the job done. Alhamdulillah. So even like, uh, it's, it's another example. Uh, last time, subhanAllah, something happened with the, we've had this for years with the uh, Sahab Academy with, the, you know, the same, uh, the same length. And all of a sudden, just something happened to it before the last, uh, uh, we're supposed to have the last uh, webinar we're supposed to have with you and then now this one almost didn't happen alhamdulillah but, but here we are alhamdulillah alhamdulillah Allah okay so alhamdulillah and this this topic that we have we had two topics it actually became one now which one of them was entitled in you know empowering new muslims the other one was entitled titled um mentoring and obviously part of the mentoring is is empowering i think that's you know it's one of the things that's missing so Abdullah, if you could, you know, start for us and maybe to start, you know, where we are when it comes to, you know, taking care of new Muslims and, you know, where we need to go. It's a bit of a, a broad question, but inshallah, perhaps we can, we can start there inshallah ta'ala. Okay, great. So that's a very good question, Chef. First and foremost, I, I pray you and your family are well. May Allah bless you all and everyone who's watching and listening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and alhamdulillah salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. So Jazakallah for the opportunity of having me on board. It's a, a great blessing to be able to share ideas and concepts and, and values from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, as you know, the Dawah, generally speaking, and obviously we speak in generalities because there are different exceptions, there are different people doing different things and there's some amazing work going on. But generally speaking, it's a kind of Shahada-focused reality where we are fo focused on getting the win if you like getting the person and making sure that they embrace islam and that they affirm the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they affirm that there is no deity worthy of worship except allah and that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his final messenger and once that happens we are delighted we say takbir and we we have the tears we have the hugs and and so on and so forth and then maybe we may spend a day or two with the person and then we just let them be we actually sometimes may forget all about them now the strategy that we should ad adopt is that we should really focus on the idea that the shahada is relatively easy from the point of view that when allah decides to guide someone no one can misguide them and we are just you know empty tools that allah uses to manifest his names and attributes the fact that he is the one who guides and he is the one who is the merciful and the loving and so on and so forth. When, so when Allah decides to shower his love and his mercy and his guidance on someone, no one and nothing can stop it. So from that perspective, we have to understand the bigger picture that the shahada is easy. We're just here just to plant the seed in people's hearts and minds. And inshallah, Allah will make it grow into the fruits of Iman. Now, the difficult part is post shahada. That is, in my view, probably the most difficult stage and I remember it was relatively easy me becoming a Muslim. I became Muslim around 18 or 19 years ago. And I became Muslim because I was intellectually convinced I was interested or attracted to the values of Islam. And I used to pray Salah. I used to pray Salah before I became Muslim. Right. And that was a huge help. And I remember my, one of my brother's friends in college, he would basically say to us that you are closest to your Lord in sajda, in the prostration, so supplicate to your Lord. So I would put my head in prostration, I'll pray salah, and I would ask Allah for guidance in salah, in sajda. And I think after a couple of weeks, alhamdulillah, I embraced Islam. But the most difficult fitna was after the shahada for me, right? When it came to shubuhat, when it came to even shahawat, how do I deal with these blameworthy desires, right? I don't have the right people around me. How do I deal with these destructive doubts? Because shubuhat can be extremely dangerous. 
because a shubha is you know something that tries to resemble the truth but it's not the truth it tush bihu it tries to resemble the truth but it's really a wolf in sheep's clothing so how do i prevent myself from being infected with these shubuhat right because the idea of being infected with destructive doubts is a matter of the qalb because the qalb what does it do it does taqallub is always wavering right and we have to keep our heart firm on iman but it's always va- wavering and the, the shubha or the shubuhat they want to attack the heart like a parasite and drain your iman how do i deal with these things i realized later on in my journey that the best way of dealing with shahawat blame with the desires and shubuhat is actually focusing on your relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focusing on allah focusing on his names and attributes learning who allah is coming closer to him and focusing on your salah that was the main strategy anyway so the point is from my experience and obviously speaking to more learned people than me you know people who are mashayikh students of knowledge and people with lots of experience we came to the understanding that yes the most difficult period is after the shahada and when you want to educate the new muslims you have to buddy up with them you have to spend your time with them you have to invest your time because the shahada is a huge asset for us from a reward perspective and we want to hold on to that and we want to nurture our brother our beloved muslim and we need to be committed to their well-being because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the famous hadith in the arba'in of anawi the 13th hadith la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibba li nafsihi you won't truly believe unless you love for your akhi your brother uh, uh, what you love for your brother what you love for yourself now obviously this means primarily your obviously muslim brother and we have other hadith that talk about linnas it's a sahih, sahih hadith narrated by al bukhari and it's in tarikh al kabir the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said love for linnas what you love for yourself love for the people what you love for yourself but generally speaking this includes muslims we have to be committed to the well-being of non-muslims committed to their guidance and also as and now we explain this means insania as well but from the perspective of that we want goodness for human beings we want guidance for human beings and the maliki scholar ibn taqiq al aid he says something very similar that we must be committed to the well-being of all people anyway put that aside we have to love for our brother what we love for ourselves love for our muslim brother or sister what we love for ourselves and primarily this is in religious matters as well we want goodness for them we want khair for them and we want guidance for them so when we are committed and we spend time with them we can't have throw the whole fiqh book at them oh you do this to your eyebrows you have to wear this you have to walk like this you have to speak like this you have to eat like this you have to say this you have to do this all of these crazy issues we have to understand a very particular methodology when it comes to new muslims and primarily i'm not saying we should forget everything else but it's in stages we have to understand the hikmah here saying the right thing in the right time in the right way in the right place right that's hikmah and obviously using the quran and sunnah as a basis for that so when we deal with the new muslim we have to understand that the two primary things they have to focus on is obviously reaffirming the iman the shahada understanding what the shahada is what does worship mean what does it mean when we say that allah is worthy of worship that he's worthy to be known he's worthy to be loved to be adored to be obeyed and he's and we must single out and direct all acts of worship to him alone the internal acts of worship like the acts of worship of the heart like tawakkul like muhabba like um uh, reliance and gratitude and so on and so forth and the external acts of worship like dua and salah and sadaqa and so on and so forth but all of those things have internal elements as well when we talk about ikhlas and niya but that's a different topic so the point is they need to understand why allah is worthy of worship and then to affirm that when they say that they affirm that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the final prophet it actually means that they use him as a guide with regards to how to worship allah they use him as a guide as with regards to who allah is and to know allah and to follow what allah is telling us so that needs to be affirmed for sure but in order to spiritually align themselves to that they have to focus on who allah is learn who allah is his names and attributes and connect with allah and the primary way that a believer connects with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through the salah so they have to learn the salah understand the salah understand the different actions of the prayer also understand the at least the basic fiqh behind the prayer the pillars of the salah the pillars of wudu but also know the inner dimensions of wudu and what i mean by inner dimensions what the quran and sunnah talk about this and what allah and his messenger talk about this and what 
the early pious predecessors talk about this. For example, in Budu, that you're imagining that your sins are being washed off, right? Because the Prophet Sallallahu told us about this. When we're in sajd sajda, we understand that we are closest to our Lord, which is based on the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who we should talk to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Also, we should understand all the other kind of uh, dimensions of salah and the, the kind of spiritual objective of salah, as Allah says in Surah Mu'minun, indeed successful are the believers, those who are, who are sub submissive in their prayer, the khashi'un, those who have love and humility and awe of Allah's majesty. How do you develop that? You know, so we need to focus on the salah so they have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the two main things. Everything else becomes secondary because you have to affirm the shahada, make them make sure that they understand why Allah is worthy of worship, understand that the Prophet ﷺ is a guide with regards to worshiping Allah and obeying Allah and to and following Allah and the Messenger ﷺ in terms of how to live one's life. And at the same time, they need to know who Allah is, learn his names and attributes, and focus on the salah. These are the two main things. And this is based on the famous hadith the hadith of Maad ibn Jabal, radiallahu an. Because as you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sent Maad ibn Jabal to Yemen and he wanted, he wanted him to call people to Islam and teach them the practices of the deen, the practice of the religion. And uh, this was this hadith, which is in Sahih Muslim, was narrated by Ibn Abbas, radiallahu an. And basically he said to Maad ibn, uh, sorry, not Maad ibn Jabal, Maad, yes, Maad ibn Jabal, he said to him, verily, you are coming to people among the people of the book. So call them to testify that there is no God but Allah. There is no deity worthy of worship but Allah. And I am the messenger of Allah. If they accept that, then teach them that Allah has obligated the five prayers in each day and night. If they accept that, then teach them that Allah has obligated charity to be taken from the rich and given to the poor. In other words, zakat. If they accept that, Beware not to take from the best of the wealth. Be on guard from the supplication of the, of the oppressed. There is no barrier between it and Allah. Also, we have another tradition speaking to Mad ibn, uh, Mad ibn Jabal. When the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'adh, when he sent him to Yemen, he said, make things easy and do not make things difficult. Give glad tidings and do not repel evil. Cooperate with each other and do not become divided. So this is very important as a kind of strategy for dealing with new Muslims that we basically allow them to grow and develop, yeah? So we focus on the shahada, then we focus on the salah, and then we continue that journey. And at the same time, we have this approach, which is the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which, would, which was really, you could argue that it's a, like a, a principle in the deen to make e things easy for people, make things easy for people and, do not make things harsh, give people glad tidings, the good news, talk about the reward of Allah, talk about the good news, and cooperate with each other and do not become divided. So if we follow this approach with the new Muslims, then inshallah, we'll be able to allow them to grow and progress further in their deen. So let me just summarize here. Number one, we have to focus on the post shahada, which is one of the most difficult, which means we have to spend our time and our effort to really buddy up and be committed to the goodness and guidance of our beloved Muslim. This is true love. This is what it means to love for others what you love for yourself, to be committed to the khair of that person, truly committed to the goodness of that person and committed to the guidance of that person, to be totally committed. How do you show that total commitment? Is being their friend, being close to them, helping them, guiding them, giving them good advice. And the way to do that from the, from the context of someone becoming a new Muslim is that you, you really help them affirm their shahada from the point of view of understanding truly what it means. That they understand that when they said that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah, they actually know what that means. And when they said that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the final prophet, they actually know what that means. Once we establish that with hikmah, with rahmah, remember with compassion and kindness, because the Prophet said that if you put kindness in something, it elevates it. If you remove kindness, it degrades it. So we have to do this with kindness and with hikmah and obviously with ilm, with knowledge. So once we do that, then we focus on, at the same time, we focus on who Allah is. Remind them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah's names and attributes. Because the more they know Allah, the more they would love Allah. 
And the more they know Allah, the more they will, will obey Allah. The more they know Allah, the more they will worship Allah. The more they know Allah, then they'll, they'll understand why salah is so important. And then what we'll do at the same time, we focus on the primary way on, um, in connecting with Allah, which is through the salah. Teach them the obligation of salah, the virtues of the salah, make it easy for them, take them through a step-by-step -step process, but also get them to understand the dimensions, the inner dimensions of salah, starting from wudu, because the ulama say salah starts from wudu from that perspective, because you get into the right mindset. And then if you go through all of these things and you get the person in the most simple and basic way over time to progress, to be able to connect with Allah and to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that will provide the essential foundations for everything else in Islam. And at the same time, as per the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu talking to Muad ibn Jabal, that you have to make things easy for people. Don't make things difficult. Make it easy. And don't and, and give them glad tidings. Remind them of the rewards. And at the same time, cooperate with each other and do not be divided. So this will be a summary before we have a kind of discussion on this. There's many other issues that we need to focus on as well because, you know, the tests come when someone becomes Muslim. It could be kind of tests of Iman, like Shubuhat. It could be tests test of the nafs, like Shahawat, blameworthy desires, and tests of Iman, which are Shubuhat, which are destructive doubts, doubts that want to undermine the religion and distort the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could be other social tests, tests coming externally from family members and so on and so forth. And everyone has their particular context. But I wanted to focus on this essential strategy because this fits everywhere yes the other social things it's unique to time place people communities resources etc and people's context but it, but notwithstanding the most important thing or one of the most important things that you should always have as a strategy is reaffirm the shahada teach them about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and teach them the salah and get them to connect to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once you do that everything else falls into place over time so it's very interesting. I've actually had several meetings over the last week and regarding you know, different programs where, inshallah, playing for new Muslims. And we discussed many of these things. I think a lot of the time people don't realize the issue of, like you said, you know, going back over the shahada with them. Because the, the easy part, as you mentioned in the beginning, dawah, it's actually not that difficult. Once you get the courage and know how to speak to people, and in convincing people, it's not that difficult. Because you're talking to the fitra, you have the haq with you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have the wahi with you. So convincing someone is easy. And I, I give an example, just like when it comes to, you know, going to the gym and trying to get back into shape, it's, it's easy to convince someone, you know, we can have a, a talk here and people will get pumped up and, you know, those, 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 they'll go healthy for a week or two. And, you know, so it's basically taking a shahad to get back into shape and he'll go to the gym in the beginning, but to stick to the gym, that's the hard part, right? To be continuous and going back and forth and making sure you have a clean diet and you're doing what you're supposed to do and you're consistent. This is the challenge now is the problem. So this is the real, you know, the hard work comes after the shahada. And this is, I think, you know, what we haven't been realizing or have been focusing on. This is the shortcoming we've been having as an ummah. Something else very, very important. You mentioned the issue of, you know, like the buddy system, that you become a friend to that person and you come close to them. If you look in the, you know, because a lot of things, and I, I mentioned this, I give an Arabic uh, talk about this at the beginning of the month. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, here that a lot of the times we forget is that all of the, Sahaba themselves were new Muslims as well. They they took their shahada entered to Islam, so they had the new, the journey of the new Muslim as well, which we were like, oh yeah, Subhanallah, that's right, you know. They, we forget that. What did they do when they first became Muslim? And it, like you mentioned, the Hadith of Mu'ad. We uh, I did something in Arabic and English here for Sahaba Academy a couple of months ago, and he, focusing on detail. There's many lessons there. When he sent uh, Musa radiyallahu an to Medina, similar benefits we gain. But if you look right there. In Mecca, even though it was secret in the beginning, Dar al Arqam, where they had their, you know, their, their, their gathering place where they would come together, they would learn the Quran. That's what he focused on. That he said, in his da'wah, was focusing on the Quran, attaching him to the Quran, and attaching him to the Salat. One of the things that, that, that people tend not to realize is that Salat was there from the beginning. Sahih was made far compulsory in the 10th year. But they had, you know, Qiyam Layl and all of the Salat from the beginning. So he, 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 what is he focusing on? The, the Quran, the, the Salat. And seeing Islam in action through the actions of the of the of the Prophet وسلم, and being in that environment, so that's that's what we're missing nowadays is that environment when he and he, like you said, each person is going to be different. For me, I you, I, I, I know your story very well. You told me several times, and I've heard it also, you know, online that you know your issue was the shubuhat, and for me it was shahwat. 
that, that was my issue. And, they, and they, the, the lifestyle that I was living, the lifestyle that's right outside of my door, how do I say no to it? Because it was, it was just something you're so attached to, so it's so appealing, it's right there. How do you, how, what do you do with that? Each person is different. A person might go, like you said, and when he said, you know, to make it easy for the people. And he has a new Muslim, people go in stages. You'll find some, a brother, much on one month, he's already growing his beard. He's got his kufi on. He's in the masjid five times a day. And another one, you know, he's, in, he's, he's still in, 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 in like he going to nightclubs like he was before and, and, and very far from Islam. So I mean, th th this is, I think, the, the issue that we need to realize is that, you know, that uh, the hard work, it comes, you know, after the shahada. And we really, really need to start working on that. Alhamdulillah, there have been, you know, I think there's been some progress made in people realizing that, but we still, you know, have, have a very long way to go. Yes, sir. It, 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 speaking about the, the, the challenges, if you want to add something else to mention, or, you know, I think maybe the challenges that, that the new Muslim face and, and how to deal with those, any, because- Yeah, I think, Sheikh, one of the major challenges is parents, to be honest. Yeah. And I had this issue as well. So with, with, with my father, so, you know, one of my main issues that I had with my dad was that, you know, my dad, although, you know, everyone has their own imperfections and limitations, but generally speaking, he was always like a hero to me, right? You know, he had very strong principles when it came to other people. You know, he gave, he gave his inheritance away just to keep family unity. He basically took the blame when he didn't deserve the blame. He was very, very hardworking and so on and so forth. So when I become Muslim, now all of a sudden I think, oh my God, what am I going to do now? I have to now break, you know, you know uh, break my father down because I have to try and believe that he is not worthy of him being my hero because he's not Muslim, right? Which was, which was a ridiculous thing to do. So I had this kind of lens, which was, right, I have to make my dad not worthy of some kind of love adoration and respect because he's not he's not he's not muslim anymore so obviously i didn't know much about islam because we know the prophet Islam actually you know praised non-muslims from the perspective of the their justice or for example their wisdom like how did khalid bin walid become muslim the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, i think told someone to write him a letter saying how can a wise person not be muslim so the way he elevated him, even though he was not Muslim at the time, he basically, you know, created that realization that, subhanAllah, yes, I am wise, I should be Muslim, and whatever the case may be. So the person had an amazing way of getting the best out of people, even when they were non-Muslims. And even when he talked about, you know, other people, he, he appreciated the virtues. But, you know, I had this black and white mindset, not very grounded in the Quran and Sunnah. So I have these kind of lenses that basically is trying to challenge my dad, at least, from, at least from a psychological perspective. I may have understood some of these ideas in an abstract way, but psychologically I had these lenses, which was, right, my dad has to be bad, right? And I was really, really bad son. I mean, I was terrible. Like the way I was speaking to him, having debates and discussions. I remember once I tried to refute him so much that he ran out into the garden, started smoking. He said, is this how Islam teaches you to treat your father? Wallahi. Thinking about that, I feel like crying. Yeah. So I had this realization in, in, in this course I did. It was like a three-day course or something. And on the Sunday, I had some homework to call my dad and to have this breakthrough. And that course taught you that you're just full of ego. You always want to be right. You never want to be wrong. You want to look good. You never want to look bad. You always want to impose. You don't want to be imposed upon to the degree that you give up the truth and you give up what's right. And I realized that a lot of it was ego. It wasn't Islam. So I call my dad and I say, dad, I just want to let you know, you're still my hero, your great grandfather, I love you to bits, you know, we may have differences on, on these things, but you're still my hero, you're still a great dad, you've done everything for us, even your mistakes, you did them because you, stri you strived to give us a better life and to make us happy and all of these kind of things. And my dad started crying and I hardly have seen my dad crying before, right? And um and, and that was an amazing breakthrough. He calls my mom in the evening. And he basically says to my mom, oh, you know, you know, I'm, I'm ready to die now. I feel complete as a father kind of thing. So and that changed my, the dynamic of the relationship because I took back control. I was like, well, let me take some power back. It's my responsibility the way I've been relating to him. I can't blame him all the time. And so I took back control of the relationship. And now the way we relate is very positive. I could talk about Islam much more naturally to the point. You know, I think it was two years ago, the, my dad in the car said, you know, this Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa I believe, you know, he must have been a prophet. Because I was natural in my dawah, you know, I took them to my house to have dinner and, 
and we were talking about certain hadith because you know my parents were just like yeah as greek parents were bickering a bit and i was talking about the hadith of you know the person being very tolerant and easy you know one of the sahaba who was like a who was like a jester or a joker he took a camel and slaughtered it and that camel wasn't his and the Prophet laughed and paid off the camel just to show the nice, soft nature of the Prophet And my dad, when he hearing one of these different stories that I was giving in real time to apply to my parents' scenario, on the way back, my dad said, you know, you know, this person must have been a prophet kind of thing, right? So the dynamic of the relationship changed. So what lessons do we have from this? What I tell non-Muslims usually, and by the way, yes, there is abuse. By the way, there's a lot of Islamophobia. Islamophobia but generally speaking, we create a story in our minds and we have to realize even though we may get pressure from our parents we have to realize that fundamentally allah has placed the rahmah in their hearts for their children it's very rare or some kind of exception that parents don't genuinely love their kids and even if they react negatively to islam and they're islamophobic that's their frame of reference all they know is that information you have to understand that it's not you they still love you to bits and the way they're expressing themselves is from a place of love. If you understand that, the way you relate to them could be fundamentally different because you would start from a point of empathy. You at least understand where they're coming from, right? And once you do that, you won't react because usually in the beginning, you have this kind of ego reaction. You have to just allow them to take their journey and through your behavior, through your connection with them, they'll say, you know what? Islam's not a bad thing. Look at the changes that she's making or he's making. And if you say to your parents, mom and dad, you know what? I love you to bits. I haven't changed. I've just enhanced who, what, what my natural disposition is, is to worship only one God, not to worship the creation, to worship the one that is worthy of the creator. I now I'm enhanced. I am, for example, Suzanne 2.0. I am Petros 2.0 because now I have to respect and love you all much, much more. Do you know what the Quran says about parents? Do you know what the Prophet Sassanam said about parents? These are my values and these are values that you taught me too because Islamic values are unique but they're also very universal because they're in line with people's fitrah. And if you say to them, we understand where you're coming from, it's a place of fear, it's a place of anxiety. That if you're able to communicate that to your parents and say to them, mom and dad, I know you love me. Yes, you're angry. Yes, you're upset. Yes, you think I've gone backwards. Yes, you think there's going to be a, a dangerous path for me because I've become a Muslim. I appreciate everything you're saying because I know what position and reference point you have. But let me tell you, I know you're doing this because you love me. Just give me the opportunity to show to you that I'm still your daughter, but inshallah, slightly enhanced because I have this amazing tradition. I don't want to speak about it. I want to live it and I want to show you how amazing it is. So when you have these type of conversations, you drastically and dynamically change the kind of power relation of the relationship that you take full control and when i've told people to do that it, some hopefully it's worked there was this hindu river sister i think it was at a retreat she said to me no my dad he's never said i love me i love you and then i said to her well when was the last time you said you love your dad and she was like taken aback a bit and i said why don't you write him a letter kind of thing so sometimes we always look at the external look they don't love me they don't do anything they shout me all the time but then when you look at yourself saying mm, maybe i'm part of the problem too how do I take control of that relationship? And it's called enrolling people in your behavior. Meaning if you want love at home, then you need to start being loving. And that's going to start enrolling others in your behavior. I know this is very difficult. It requires a leadership mindset. It requires a lot of confidence. But that is the kind of approach you should have with your parents. But don't get me wrong. Lot, some parents, unfortunately, they're quite aggressive. They chuck you know, their daughters out of the house and so on and so forth. And those are exceptions that require sensitivity and wisdom and a lot of support from the community. But generally speaking, if you follow the approach that I've just taken, which is a pro an approach of empathy, reaffirming that your parents love you, understanding that, understanding that they're coming from a position of ignorance, also relating them to a way through your behavior, building that trust and that love, making them understand that you are now Hamza 2.0, Fatima 2.0, Suzanne 2.0, David 2.0, and relating, relating to them in that way not expecting any reward from them, not expecting any praise from them, doing it for the sake of Allah. Over time, and you have that stance, you want to win them, win them over. Even if, even if they don't become Muslim, they would, they would always see you as the trustworthy one. They'll see you as the solid one. They'll see you as the wise one. And they'll see you as the one who's more, you know, very loving. And the way you relate to them is in, from a position of empathy. So if you have that approach with your parents, from ex experience, it can work. And it does work. And it's a very powerful way of dealing with your parents now 
you know, what usually happens, unfortunately, Sheikh, is sometimes, you know, non new Muslims get bad advice. You know, when there's an argument, then it becomes an us and them and them kind of scenario. You have to realize, you know, private individual families with people becoming Muslim is not an issue of social global politics. Sometimes we take the global political scene, Islam versus Kufr, and we bring it down to the, the little household. And this is not the narrative of the Quran. If you study the Sunnah of giving Dawah individually, it's individualistic, meaning you individualize it. You find out what is the person's specific context. But when it comes to social politics, it's a different issue. But when we're talking about your neighbor, your fellow brother and sister in humanity and so on and so forth, when you relate to these people, you have to understand their particular context and you should always seek reconciliation and peace and harmony. But sometimes we get this crazy mindset that you know everything is like a is like a global political war right at home in your bedroom with your mom and dad now the villa right it's just crazy so it's a misapplication of walan bara from that perspective yeah so you know that's my advice it worked with with my dad but you know alhamdulillah i didn't have the pressures that other muslim new muslims had you know allah made it very easy for me i have phenomenal parents alhamdulillah may allah guide them and may allah guide every everyone's parents i mean but that would be from my experience um, to basically deal with your parents. Obviously, there are specific, very serious issues of abuse, serious issues of being alienated, and those require, you know, more specialism. But and I'm not frankly qualified to even deal with those problems. But it does require good social structures. And just a final point before we continue, Sheikh, what we need to start understanding is that this is not an individual matter. We need to build a Muslim community, an ideal Muslim community that is structured to facilitate the affairs of new Muslims. It's not just an individual body system. There's only so much, for example, I could do. Say I'm a body to five people. That's gonna take up all my time. That would be literally almost a full-time job. What if they have marriage issues? What if they have economic issues, housing issues, uh, ab issues concerning abuse? It's like, subhanAllah, where are you gonna go? You know, do we have the right systems and organizations within our community? Are we structured in a unified way to facilitate these issues? One would argue we're probably not there yet, Sheikh. And that's why, and this is what's lacking in the, in, in the discussion. We always talk about buddy and dealing with them on a one-to-one -one level, but what about on the communal level? That is so significant. How significant? Have we empowered the masajid? Have we empowered our communities? Are we investing the zakah, the sadaqah in the right way? Are we being strategic with our sadaqah and zakah to build our communities so we can facilitate the iman of new Muslims and the whole community. And that requires things like counseling. That requires things like marriage services, for example. You know, there are sisters, 30s, 40s, unmarried, unmarried, right? Looking for marriage. No one is helping them. No one is dealing with these issues. Other people have economic problems. Other people have mental health issues. Who's dealing with this? You're gonna send them to any counselor? No, you, you think a counselor is like Imam Mahdi? You need to take them to someone who has an Islamic background, who has professional expertise and professional qualifications, but understands the Islamic tradition as well. Otherwise, it could be a source of someone's misguidance. There are so many issues involved. So the point here is we need to have a, a discussion concerning the structure of our communities and how have we resourced them and empowered them to the degree that really supports what we need to do. And that you know it brings me to another question. And when you mentioned like you know if you had five people who you were in charge, and it's like a full time job. This, in reality, I mean, if you look at all of the stuff we need, because like you mentioned, I mean, a lot of new Muslims people don't realize the baggage that they're coming with. Okay, yeah, he he might even sometimes you'll see that the brother you know who, who becomes you know a good new Muslim practicing Muslim, you know, a sister with the, you know full hijab, but don't realize that they're coming from a background. Uh, you know, where they've been through, you know, abusive situations, they have mental health, you know, issues, which are very, very real. And, yes. and a, a lot of times, I think even in our community, unfortunately, when it comes to mental health, and I, I've been studying a lot of this lately, you know, and, and doing different counseling and stuff like that with, you know, uh, for brothers and sisters. And and a lot of times, even in the, in the, the wider Muslim community, you know, it, it's it's a jinn, it's you know a magic sihr. It's it's it, I, and, all, and all of these things are real. I'm not saying that otherwise, but it's become like the common thing just to blame it on that. But reality, people mm. have, have serious mental issues, especially in the West. And they, yes. you know, I, I remember that one of our brothers who was, who was a pharmacist, he was telling me in the, in the city I was living in, in Ireland, for example, the percentage of people who are on antidepressants and you know prescription drugs just to get by. 
and that you know leads you also why they why are they addicted to alcohol? You know, sometimes we look why are they drinking so much because of the situation they're in. So all that baggage, you know, they're trying to get out of the situation they're in by drinking and using drugs and what have you or prescription drugs. And then that that individual comes into Islam and he's you know just not all there. We don't realize you know the, the struggles they're facing. So what what any a, a reality you know because for example if you have Ayer or Sapien, you know how many people do you guys have on staff and how much the reality can you cover us in Sahaba Academy. You know, we have maybe just a couple of employees, five, six, maybe, and uh, or seven full-time employees. And how much can we cover? You know, what, what is the reality? And and that being the reality, you know, what can we do and where can we go? Because this is it's it's a real problem. And then we didn't mention at the beginning. Uh, I mentioned in my lecture in Arabic. Uh, also, brother Dujar, uh, the brother who did the introduction, he's from he's uh, from Germany. Uh, he uh, he mentioned even because I know I know that we mentioned the course that we we do with Aira. For new Muslims, it's about 50% roughly who leave Islam in the UK. Uh, Brother Jutjar gave us even a bigger number he had heard from someone else in the UK that, that, of, of the people who, who leave Islam, who accept Islam. And when, when Muslims hear that, a lot of people here with us now, obviously, you know, Muslims from a lot of Arab countries, especially, and we, like you said, we hear the takbirs and people are happy and this and the hugs and the tears. All of a sudden, you know, they don't realize that these people actually have taken the shahada, but they've you know, relapsed and they end up leaving Islam. So, and that, that being the case, you know, there being so much need and it being, it's, it's really challenging. You know, what, what is the solution? Is, is it really possible? I mean, do we, are, with, with the, the limited, you know, uh, stuff that we have, the abilities we have, or, the, you know, the, the means that we have, is it any, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to be negative, but the, the reality in front of us, it doesn't look like it's going to be that easy. So I know, what, what is the way? Basically? Yeah, sure. Well, I don't have the answer. I have my intuitions, but, you know, I don't even think I'm even qualified to give an answer on this, but my kind of tadabbur on this issue is that, look, ideally, you need a, a social political entity with resources to give you structures in a society to facilitate people's affairs. This is about politics, really, if you think about it. But obviously, we're not on that level. What we have to do, we just have to basically do our best. And I think we need to revive that. If you focus on the hadith of Muad ibn Jabal, not the hadith when he was advised when he was going to Yemen in terms of the stages, but the hadith concerning ease. Isn't it interesting? The Prophet said, make it easy for people, remind people about the glad tidings, and do not be divided. Isn't that very interesting? Do not be divided. And how do we unite? We unite by holding on to the rope of Allah. What is the rope of Allah? It's the Quran. What is the summary of the Quran? It's Tawheed, right? So, so the, the, the issue here is that we need to understand, we need to be a little bit more unified and strategic. Now, what I mean by strategic, I'm a true believer that we have enough money in the Ummah, even as we are, right? I'm telling you we have enough money. We just need a unified vision and a unified strategy. Once you have a unified vision and strategy, then you could put all those resources into that unified resource and strategy. But that requires, Sheikh, a sense of really powerful leadership. We have leaders amongst the community that could come together and they say, you know what? Enough is enough. How many organizations are we going to have? How many uh, this, that, and the other are we going to have? These are all great. And it's all khair. It's not a problem. But let's now have a unified strategic vision and get all of this, these, these, these financial resources and put it into these resources and also we could encourage people who you know really spend a hell of a lot of money on on absolute meaning meaningless things like you have a lot of money being spent in the ummah on literally pointless dunya right we could inspire those people and give doubt to those people to get them to see the vision of how we're going to move communities forward and that can start with a, a pilot project it could be for example you know somewhere in france or somewhere in the uk or anywhere in europe that you've had this unified vision with the community, that you say, right, what does the community need? That's the question we have to ask ourselves, not only for the Muslims in terms of the tarbiyah and the ilm, but also the development and the support of the new Muslims. Once you answer those questions, then you come together strategically in order to achieve that. And But that requires a unified vision, Sheikh. We have to ask the question, where do we want to see the community? So that's what a vision is. It's like, where do I want to see the community? So say we're talking about London. I want to see a London, a place where Muslims can practice their religion freely and, and new Muslims can, can learn the, the deen effectively, easily, in peace, and with a sense of unity. Say that's your vision. And say you get key leaders from different parts of the community in London to buy into that vision. So that's a big thing. Once you buy into that vision, you have to do a strategic exercise, meaning how are we going to achieve it? What are the three main areas we're going to work on in order to achieve it? So some would argue, 
you know, we need more new Muslim centers, we need more mashayikh, or whatever the case may be. Once you get the idea of what your, the, your top three to five actions are, then you'll have a strategy of marketing that to the rest of the community and getting people to throw all of the monetary and financial resources into that. If we don't have that, then it's not going to happen. You need to have a vision that people are unified and they bought into all parts of the community. Then you need to have a strategy, maybe three to five or 10 key actions that you all decide that are necessary to fulfill your vision. Once you get that in place, then the rest is easy. But it requires very powerful leadership. It requires someone with a lot of wisdom and a lot of uh, uh, kind of, uh, they, have to have, they have to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sure, but they also have very good leadership skills that gets the community bought into a certain vision. Then after that gets the key players from different organizations and parts of the community to start to think about what are the key actions that are going to ensure that we fulfill this vision. And then after that, it becomes a little bit easier. But that requires a lot of different parties to have the right tarbiyah, not to do it for the ego, to do it for the sake of Allah, not just to prove that they're right or want to impose. And these, this, is, this is a tarbiyah issue. And that's why, you know, like with most things, I don't believe that vision and strategy is everything. Right, you know, many people could say, well, the solution is we need a positive Islamic government that would, you know, spread peace and harmony around the world. Well, that's easy, but how do you get there, right? So the point is, it's easy to say what needs to be done. And I am a true believer that it's not just about vision and strategy. It's also about the hearts of the people, because I believe all of this fundamentally, I know this might sound like, oh my God, I'm just, you know, self-hating, self-hating. It's not. This, for me, I believe is Quran and Sunnah. We have to also realize this is also a sign of our collective spiritual malaise. Like Allah says, Allah does, uh, in Allah Indeed, Allah does not change the situation of a people until the change was within themselves. The tafsir is, what, if you're in a good situation, it will not change into a bad situation unless something has happened, right? Like uh, dhunub, for example, lots of sin or whatever the case may be. Also, Allah says in the Quran, Surah Tawbah, Oh, you believers, return to Allah jami'an, collectively, in order for you to be successful. This doesn't mean we all have to be angels, because Allah says, turn to Allah. Turn from where? That we do mistakes when turning back. There should be a, a sense of collective turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, we, we have to, and even the famous hadith, I think, I believe this is a hadith in Tirmidhi, there are two narrations. One is not entirely sahih, one is sahih. And it's based upon the hadith about marriage, like if a man with good morals comes to your daughter and you reject him for no good re reason, there will be facade, correct? There will yeah. be facade uh, in, 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 in the world. So there is a link between these moral actions and what's happening in the world, right? Even Allah says, by what their hands have, have earned, there'll be facade, facade on the earth and the sea, right? So we have to appreciate that from a collective perspective, maybe the reason that we haven't come together and and, and, and come together in a in unified vision and really discuss what actions we have to do and put all our resources together to achieve that is maybe because there's something inside that we need to fix as well. Now, this is not bad news. This is not like Muslim blaming. This is a good thing because if we know what the solutions are. Yes, we need to talk about the external things like vision and strategy, but we should remind ourselves of the internal stuff that we need to really work on really hard in order to be deserving of that victory and that success. And I think that's something very important that we need to highlight, especially, you know, when we see disasters happening all around the world and, you know, political problems, we also have to realize, yes, activism is good. Speaking about things is good. Commanding the good and forbidding the evil is good. But there is an internal element and that needs to be in place in order for success to happen anyway in the first place. And frankly, with all due respect, I don't think that's been highlighted enough. Uh, and maybe that's one of our problems as well, but yeah. It's something interesting I just, I just thought about. And if we, you know, you talk about like on, on the community level, if we were just, you know, to start maybe in the UK or, you know, brothers in America, in the West, in a, or even, or even in the Muslim world, when you look at, for example, the, the local masajid, you know, there is, in you know, Alhamdulillah, we have to you know, try to be positive as much as we can. You know, Absolutely. One of, the, one of the main problems that we were facing in the da'wah, you know, from, in, between the Muslims was the issue of the youth. And the, the masajid, they weren't doing enough for the youth, but now alhamdulillah, they've realized the youth are going astray. Uh, and, and, and many of them even leaving Islam or falling into other, you know, uh, acts of haram, you know, the ones who were, who were Muslims, but very far away from the deen. So to bring them back, they started doing like, for example, youth programs. So 
Alhamdulillah, now as the new generation of, you know, the, the you know, our older chachas and the uncles who are the ones running the community now are handing the baton over to the younger ones to get, you know, that, that's an opportunity for us now to say, look, just like we did for the youth programs, what about the new Muslims? Because they're also leaving Islam. They're also not saying because they're not finding that Dar al-Arqam environment that they need. Okay. Also, another thing we can do when it comes to, and you, you alluded to this earlier about the issue of the zakat. If we were to ask our brothers, and, and alhamdulillah, we work with our brothers in the charity organizations in the UK and, and, and around the world. What are we, the, the, Allah mentioned them, you know, <laughs> from the eight recipients of zakat. But how much did they really get of that? How much wow. is none of that? If, if, if we were just to have a special, you know, janah, a special wing of, you know, of, of workers that were focused on taking care of the needs of the new Muslims from that form of zakat. And like you said, we have, we, even with the situation we're in right now as, as an ummah, we have the money. We, yes. have, we have the ability. But it's just, you know, we're, we're not doing it correctly. And something else I, I want to highlight, which is very important, what you mentioned, issue of, of our own hearts. And I remember, you know, many of our mashiach, they always talk to us about the issue of our own ibadah and the impact it has on our dawah. And if you look at the sahaba when they entered into Islam, because they understood the Qur'an, and when you go back to what you mentioned in the beginning, the issue of the shahada, you know, and people not really understanding the shahada, why did the, the, the kufar of Quraysh reject the shahada? Because they understood that it had, you know, implications of, of actions afterwards. It wasn't just, you know, an empty shahada they would say. They understood that, it, you know, they, they would act, have to act upon it. They understood the meaning of la ilaha illallah, that there would be actions after it. There would be leaving the, the shirk, leaving the ways of jahiliya, the forefathers, and then acting upon it. So, and they, but when they would enter into Islam, and they entered in Islam as Allah told us in the Quran, into the Islamic kafa completely. So when they would enter into Islam, they found that environment around them of ubad. Look at the Sahaba, Sahaba were, were ubad from the beginning. They were people who would stand through the night and pray, you know, fasting throughout the day, uh, always reading the Quran. So they had that strong relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the new Muslim who was coming into the deen, he was finding that environment. So that is, that is something very real that we need to look at you know, at ourselves and the change within ourselves and our own implementation of Islam. And a lot of times we're so focused on, and we've talked to me and you about this before, many of the brothers, we're so focused on the issue of, of giving the da'wah that we tend to forget our own selves of, of the du'at. And that, that, that has a, you know, a very negative impact on the da'wah that you know, we just, just don't tend to focus on it. We're in such a hurry to get the khair out there to the people and we forget the khair for ourselves, subhanAllah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you're right. You know, we have all the resources. We just need the lead, leadership. What I mean by leadership is, the people of influence within our communities to come together and, and come together on a unified vision and follow a particular strategy because you know there's so there's so much head in the ummah so many willing people so many people with good resources with money um with influence we just have to somehow get them together to buy into a unified vision and for us to have a set of actions that could lead to that vision and maybe we could you know a pilot study or a project in london or paris or wherever, wherever the case may be can be started to show how amazing that kind of strategy and, and vision can work. And we could just basically expand it. But yeah, you're right. You know, we, we need unified hearts as well. And those hearts have to be soft. They have to be connected to Allah without, you know, ego and hasad and kibber and ujub and all of these things. And then that requires a lot of work. But, you know, there is a lot of khair as well. As you know, the dawah, when I became Muslim in 2004, sorry, 2002, it's totally different now. Like, subhanAllah, we didn't have, any support structures hardly. We didn't even have the internet. We didn't even understand basic fiqh. We didn't even understand basic Islam. We didn't have that kind of, you know, you know, the dawa now is on a different level from that perspective. I mean, if you were lucky and you were in a community that had people around you, but if you didn't, you were almost like relatively lost. You didn't really know what to do. And you were susceptible to, you know, joining, you know, dodgy groups or whatever the case may be. So now, alhamdulillah, you could see there is a great progression with the dawa. And there's something amazing that is happening. Um, and there is great news. So, you know, for example, you, you know, what's happening with various charities. They're also doing great work around the world. In Africa, you have local communities. For example, the brothers in Newcastle and IDC, what Aira is doing with the new Muslim retreats. So there is great work that is doing all that's happening all around the world. Um, but as you said, more, more that needs to be done, much more that needs to be done, inshallah. It's one, and, he, and what you mentioned about your father, subhanAllah, I, um, and I, I had something similar with my father, actually I realized maybe much later. I always had a good relationship, alhamdulillah. I didn't really have a problem with my family, 
even they were they kind of they they were happy when I became Muslim because they saw the change. And I was in a very I was in a very bad position in Jahiliya, you know, and it was a lot of trouble. So Islam changed that, and they saw the quick change that had Islam had on me and the impact that Islam had on me. So they 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 liked that. So, but I realized after some time the impact of my you know, that my father had on on, on me, and uh, you know a lot of the the morals and the principles that I live by today, which a lot of the like you said your 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 father the, the things that he did for the better of the family and you know gave up his inheritance. So a lot of those those life lessons that I have as well, I actually benefited from my father, and I made a video and I I, I don't know if you saw it and I was like uh, fourteen different things that uh, life lessons I learned from my father. It was very touching. oh really yeah yeah oh, oh wow. I need to, I'm going to watch that today. Allah yeah, Akbar. I'll send it to you. Did, did, did he watch it? Oh, or he loved he... it. He loved it. Because, and the thing was, is finally, and he actually, I, I, it was something I, I wanted to do for so long, and I just never did. I wrote down some points a long time ago. And uh, my father actually had uh, got COVID. He was driving one of his golf buddies. He, he, he has a problem with any, uh, a breathing problem as it is. And he's on oxygen and even before COVID. So the, the, they, they called us and told us that, you know, he wasn't going to make it. Uh, in the hospital, but and he did, alhamdulillah. So I mean, he was back home, and, and then I just did this video. I said, you know, my wife said, look, you have to do it. You, know, you can't keep putting it off. So I just sat down and you know turned on the camera and, and just did it, alhamdulillah. And uh, and uh, it was pretty good. Alhamdulillah. Even the brothers on uh, uh, Digital Memoir they they posted it as well. So I'll, I'll put the link, inshallah, and I'll send it. To oh you. please, oh my God, that's such. A, you know what? That's yeah. such an inspiration because I thought I felt of doing something very similar as well, Chef. But you yeah, know what? Shaitan yeah. always wants to. Put you off and that's stop it. you from that's doing it. Happened to me, man. You know, my father, he, he really touched me. My stepmother, she said it was really, really touching for him. Subhanallah. Right. Amazing. Amazing. That's such an inspiration. Well, I feel like crying. That's amazing. I haven't even watched the video yet. Allah. Oh, my love, bless you, Shaykh. That's that is that is really good. You know, that's really good adab and care for your parents. That's 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 proper. That's proper birr that is. Wallahi, well, jazakallah, Shaykh. That is. Wow. That's I'm phenomenal. Sure. So something very, very interesting as well, and he, like I told you, we, we did it like two months ago here with the brothers and sisters on, on the Sahaba Khan. We did the, uh, the Hadith of Mu'adh. I went, I went in detail and I grabbed the, the different narrations. And actually very interesting, as you were mentioning it, I just opened back up my notes to, to look at it. And he, it, was, it was actually the, the, you know, one of the narrations of them actually being sent to Yemen. And one of the, when he told them, and he, and he, because it, it was Mu'adh and, 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 um, and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And he told them, and he, yes, sira, wa la tu as sira. He told them, treat the people with ease and don't be hard with them. And then he said, and to give you know glad tidings and don't be an aversion to people. Now don't you know push people away. Which means to love each other. And don't differ, subhanAllah. So very, very, very deep meanings when you look at the at, at the different narrations, subhanAllah. Beautiful. Yeah, and I was I was speaking to a brother, you know, like I said, I had some meetings just recently about you know the issue of you know different programs we're having for, for new Muslims. And one of the things that, that came up. And I'm sure you can you know, uh, elaborate on this as well, that a lot of the lessons that we have for new Muslims or a lot of the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the way of teaching them, a lot of it goes back to, for example, people who are not necessarily um, specialized when it comes to new Muslims, understanding what that new Muslim actually needs. And also at the same time, uh, we kind of take the traditional way of teaching knowledge that, that as Muslims were taught, you know, whether it be fiqh or what have you. So we kind of bring the Muslim into like a fiqh lesson, which I, I don't like to use the word dry, but I mean, that's kind of the best way you can describe it. It's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, even for a Muslim, honestly, sometimes it's kind of a, just a dry way of learning. Even if you put it nice, you know, a PowerPoint with nice, you know, you know it's divided into three categories or four categories, or this is, you know, there's five different things that are far to do. It makes it easy to understand but it's not really the impact that that new Muslim reads. And I, I gave an example when it came to the wudu, and you mentioned this earlier. When you look at the ayah of wudu, which is verse number six in Surah al the chapter five, we always mention this verse talking about the fara'id, the four things that are mentioned. Obviously, different madhabs have five farms or six farms or seven, whatever you, different madhab you follow from the, from the four schools of fiqh. But the point is that all, all of them agree on, on the four things mentioned in these ayah that are from the furud or the farts of wudu in this ayah. But we don't focus on what comes at the end of the ayah. So, for example, if a new Muslim were to understand this, and this is, this is what I was, I was saying to the brothers, to understand why we make wudu. And we live in a time, and you mentioned that the, the time earlier, and perhaps I, I felt the time we became Muslim, maybe the issue of the brotherhood and the, the, that environment or that atmosphere might have been better during our time. But the issue, obviously, of, of things being you know, structured and 
having things like the new Muslim retreat. I, I attended that you know, with, with the brothers in Ayer. It's absolutely amazing. That stuff wasn't available for us when we became Muslim. So that, you know, I think that maybe the, the environment maybe might've been better back in the days, like early nineties, the communities. But even, even Abdul Rahim was, uh, when I spoke about this, he was alluding to that. But like you said, the structure, no doubt it's better. But back to what I was saying about the issue of, of, of this verse. If you look at the end of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we want to ask, why, why do we make wudu? And in this, any, the, the, the times that we live in now, people want to understand why. It's not just like do, don't do, you know, halal, haram. People want to understand why they want to understand the hikmah. And Allah mentions this in the verse at the end. And he, first of all, Allah said, Ma yurid Allah doesn't want to make doesn't want to make things difficult for you. But Allah wants to purify you. And the purification here, there's there's two types. We're talking about the, the, the physical one, which is making sure you're in the clean state when you stand in your prayer. But more important, that is the spiritual state. And I think I know a lot of the times when it comes to the new Muslim, the spiritual side of Islam, which is you know what they're searching for, and is what we have that's different. Yes. And if you look at the situation of people, why are they so in such a? We mentioned about the antidepressants and the prescription drugs and you know abuse of alcohol. Why, why are people in this situation? High suicide rates in the West because Allah told us in in, in the Quran, "Woman أعرض عن ذكري فإن له معيشة ضنكا." Whoever turns away from my remembrance, from the way of Allah, has been prescribed the in, in revelation. Whoever turns away from the revelation of Allah, then he's going to live a miserable life. And these people are living in misery. And the other verse Allah told us, "Allah bi dhikri Allahi tatmanu al that indeed through the, uh, the, the, the remembrance of all the hearts find assurance. So if you look now, for example, perhaps you've seen some of these videos called the, the power mornings. You know, you, you have even people like Oprah, Barack Obama, you know, all these, you know, Tony Robbins, whoever they are, you know, the, the, um, uh, the British guy, what's it, the Virgin Airlines guy, what's his name? Um, even he, he, he did the video. Richard Branson. That's it, yeah. yeah. So, so all, all of them, you know, they have their power mornings with their exercise, eating healthy breakfast, but they have also, also have a spiritual side in the morning where they're, you know, meditating. And even like Oprah says, she'll read the Quran, she'll read the Hindu scripture, she'll read the Bible. It's just a spiritual time because that's what people are missing. And we have that in Islam. But unfortunately, we, have, we haven't given, we haven't benefited from ourselves, first of all. And then we haven't let the, the others benefit from it. So if, if a new Muslim were to come inside and understand that, that I'm making this wudu, like you said, the spiritual side, it was even mentioned in the hadith. It's mentioned here also in the ayah. And the law says, well, you alaykum, la'allakum tashkurun. That it, he will bestow his, his favors upon you and that you will be thankful. Even la'alakum tashkurun, that you will, and perhaps you will be thankful, is also mentioned in the verse of fasting as well. So when you, when you, when you, when you enter in a spiritual side, he's like, wow, yeah, that's deep. That's, that's why I'm performing this wudu, this ritual uh, with the water before I stand in prayer. And then we come after that with the fiqh aspect. And from this verse also, and here we're also attaching that new Muslim to the Quran. With, with this verse, we're coming. There's also four things you need to focus on, and maybe a fifth or sixth. What do you want to add? You know, from the from the Sunnah, that is far that you must ha- do when you when you make wudu. And it's how you make wudu, and it's mentioned in the, in, the, in, in, in the verse uh, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us. You know, obviously when you stand up for the salat, that you you know you you start that you obviously start off by washing your face and then your 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 hands up to the to the elbow and, you, and you're wiping the, the heads and then washing your feet to to the ankles so that and then you come with the fifth aspect right right this so if we can come up with, with a way like this to attach them and then you mentioned this and th- th- these are the key things attach them to the quran attach them to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when they have to connect because a lot of times when you as you mentioned about the parents when you ha- face those difficulties if you've already established that relationship with your creator with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you've established that that it is all you know as we say the, the call you know, when you're making your sujood, you're prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, opening up, speaking to Allah. When you look at the Quran, and so that's one of the things that had a huge impact on me when I first became Muslim. And it was amazing because I found many years later as a student of knowledge, when I started doing lessons about the double for myself and then teaching it as well, at the Quran, that Ibn Qayyim, he mentioned this. He said that when you read the Quran, the difference of how the, the early Muslims read the Quran, they looked at it as a khitab or risail from their Rabb. That it was a message from, 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 from Allah. So just like you receive the message now, on your, you, you pay attention to what's being said on, on your phone, right? So when you, is it, the, the, that was the difference to how they looked at the Quran and how we look at the Quran. They looked at it as a, as a message directly to them. And I said, I found when I was a Muslim, and it was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has been, and blessed some of us with that. You know, and he, but at least we need to show the people the way so they can have that same connection. For me, 
I felt that this oh, this eye was for me. This was revealed for me. This is this is this is my eye, you know, because the situation I was facing, I would find it in the Quran. So when when you have that in the, that relation is established from the beginning, uh, it's going to make them them uh, easy to e easier to deal with in Shalom Yes, exactly. So the point you made about the point you made um, about the spirituality, which is very significant. So you know when. You know, one thing I think we've missed in the dawah, even to non-Muslims and even to new Muslims, is the whole idea of why Allah is worthy of worship. The whole Quran, really, its pillar is Tawheed, the oneness of Allah and why he's, why he's worthy of worship. Even if you Google why Allah is worthy of worship, you hardly have anything on there. And there needs to be a sense of revival on moving away from the primary dawah is being fiqh, or intellectual arguments to the primary dawah being who Allah is and why he's worthy of worship. And then the rest follows. Remember the famous hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, that if the ahkam came first, then you know, they, wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have connected to the ahkam or really even maybe obeyed it properly because they required the kind of you know, worldview, you know, the akhirah, the, the recompense, that they're going to get reward and punishment, the pleasure of Allah, the wrath, wrath of Allah. You know, they need to do these things because Allah is worthy of, of our love, of, of our adoration, of our obedience, and that he, he is worthy of worship by virtue of who he is. Focus on his names and attributes. Allah is worthy of extensive praise. He's worthy of ultimate gratitude. Why? All of this is in the Quran. All of this is in the Quran concerning why Allah is worthy of worship in terms of him being, uh, he deserves extensive praise and ultimate gratitude, and that we must, you know, love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and adore Allah and obey Allah and have all of Allah and all of these amazing things and direct all of our acts of worship to Allah alone, the internal acts and the external acts. You can find all of this in the Sunnah and in the Quran, but it needs to be articulated to the non-Muslim in a way that really attracts them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really attracts them to the idea that, you know, I, I want to con constantly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that requires a drastic shift, Sheikh. And that's why I love the way you just explained it just with wudu, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. So you start with the kind of the why, you started with the spirituality of wudu and then you gave them the fiqh from the same verses. And how, how amazing is that? You know, if someone taught me that in the beginning, I would be like, so it, would be a, it would be a game changer. It would be a game changer. So likewise, this small example, if we bring it to like a strategy in the dawah, we need to start talking to people about why Allah is worthy of worship. Because if you think about it, if you reflect on chapter, I think 39, verse 29, Allah gives a, a, an amazing parable. He says, and I'm paraphrasing, consider the situation of two people. One man is a servant to many masters and they're all quarreling. And another servant, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a servant to one master. Whose condition is best? Now, from this perspective, we understand that the default position for human beings is to worship something. Man cannot not worship. Because if you define worship as the thing that you know the most, the thing that you love the most, the thing that you obey the most, the thing that you direct gratitude towards the most, that's your object of worship. So Allah is telling us that the default position of the human being, whether the atheist or not, is to worship something. And the whole point of the Quran was to free people from the shackles of, <clears throat> of fake worship, of worshiping the wrong thing. And Allah is saying that he is worthy of worship. And once we talk to people about why Allah is worthy of worship, for example, why Allah is worthy of ultimate gratitude? I mean, how many people <coughs> can even answer this question? Why is Allah worthy of utmost gratitude? Start to think about, well, Allah says in the Quran, he is al-Khaliq, he is the creator. He is al-Khalaq, he created our lives. Okay, and Allah says in the Quran that, you know, you can never enumerate, count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, brilliant. So we could start giving some analogies based on these values and these verses. For example, we could say, well, there is something that Allah gives us at every moment of our existence that we don't earn, own, or deserve, and it's priceless. And that's every conscious moment that we're experiencing. And what's very interesting is that we, we know it's priceless because if I said to you, you, you have 10 minutes left to live, but in order to get another 10 weeks, you have to give me all of your wealth, you would give me all of your wealth. So it's a priceless gift. That's why we call it the gift of life. And we don't earn, own, or deserve this gift because we can't even create a fly. So if it's true that Allah gives us this priceless gift for free, by the way, at every moment of our existence that we don't earn, own, or deserve, then how should it make us feel? We must be grateful, ultimately grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he is the one who created us and created our lives and created every one of these moments. 
Another thing, Allah says in the Quran, you know, you cannot enumerate, count individually the blessings of Allah. In the Arabic, it's singular, blessing, which is very interesting indicator here. How do we explain this? Well, even the Salaf, the pious predecessors explain this. Think about your heart, your heartbeat. Your heartbeat is the biological sabab, the biological uh, cause for you to stay alive that Allah uses, right? So we have a heartbeat. Now, if we had, if I said to you, you have a thousand heartbeats left, but in order to have another 10,000 heartbeats, you have to give me all of your wealth, you will give me all of your wealth. So every single heartbeat is priceless and precious. And we must be grateful for it. But here's the question. Can you count all of your heartbeats you've had individually in a lifetime? Can you enumerate them individually? It's practically impossible. Because in the first two or three years, you don't have to count. When you're sleeping, you can't count. When you're eating, you can't count. So practically, it's true. You cannot count individually, enumerate your blessing of a heartbeat that you've had in a lifetime. Not only this. Imagine saying, Alhamdulillah, every time you have a heartbeat. Is it practically possible every time you have a heartbeat to say Alhamdulillah? It's impossible. So not only can't you count individually your heartbeats you've had in a lifetime, you can't even be grateful for them. So it's true what Allah says, that you can't enumerate the blessing of Allah and one heart, one blessing, which is the heartbeat. So imagine all the other blessings that we have in life. And therefore, we must be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gratitude. Gratitude is the key to worship. So this is just a small thing, and it's all in the Quran. So this is this is an aspect of why Allah is worthy of worship, which is He's deserved of ultimate gratitude. What about things like hamd, praise? Why is Allah worthy of ultimate praise? Now think about this, and this is very important from a Tawheed point of view. We praise things all the time. For example, I gave a little of halal praise to the Sheikh in terms of what he did about his father concerning the video. I was very impressed. I said, "Well done, Alhamdulillah." When we watch Habib and he's, you know, doing the wrestling, we're like, Allahu Akbar, he's amazing. We give him praise by virtue of his sporting abilities. When we're watching football, for example, and we see an amazing goal by Ronaldo or Messi, we're like, wow, what an amazing goal. When we hear some great poetry, we praise the poem and say he's so eloquent. You know, if we hear some al mutanabbi for example, we were like, wow, al mutanabbi was amazing. So when we see people with certain attributes, we praise them because of those attributes whether it's sporting attributes, martial arts, football, poetry, whatever the case may be. There's something natural within us that we praise these people because of these type of attributes. But their attributes are limited and flawed. So if we're compelled to praise these people, even though they have limited and flawed attributes, then what does it mean about praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose names and attributes are perfect without any deficiency and without any flaw? Allah is worthy of the most extensive form of praise. Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater. And what's very interesting is this. We may praise the football player, but what about the one who created the football player? We may praise the amazing scientist. What about the one who created the mind of the scientist? We may be in awe of the natural world of the bird that can fly for around nine days nonstop. And one part of his brain is asleep and the other part is awake. Then it swaps and it's keep on flying. We may be in awe of this and say, wow, what amazing. But what about the one who created the bird so we so this makes us be even in more awe of allah and we understand that he is worthy of our extensive praise because of who he is and not necessarily because he's given us anything yes of course we are grateful and we praise him because of the bounties however fundamentally allah is worthy of worship even if we didn't exist allah is worthy of extensive praise even if there was nothing to praise him and this is this these small things are things that we need to revive in the dawah because they have an element of spirituality that Allah is worthy of my extensive praise and glorification, that I need to have ultimate thanks to him. And also there's things like love. Love is missing out in the discourse of the Muslims, subhanAllah. But this is very deep in our tradition. Al-Ghazali spoke about this in his Ikhya concerning muhabba, why Allah is worthy of ultimate love. You have Ibn Qayyum al jawziyah and so on and so forth. You know, these were like the heart surgeons of the ummah that were teaching us on why Allah is worthy of ultimate love. Now think about it from the perspective, and there's many reasons, but let me just summarize with this point and I'll end it here. Think about Allah's name, Al-Wudud. Allah's name coming from the word wood, which means the loving that is giving. When we focus on his name, we understand that he is perfectly loving and he has no deficiency and no flaw. Now, if I said to you, there was a human being that was going to come into your room right now, and that human being is the most loving human being that have, has ever existed, I don't care who you are, something's going to happen to your heart. You wouldn't be like, I want to know what makes him love that much. 
I want to basically, you know, try and understand or experience that type of love from, an, from a halal perspective. I just basically want to know something about that person because they're the most loving. Now, think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his love and he, the way he loves, if he decides to have this special love for his servant, is transcendent. Nothing can compare to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's perfect and pure and it's to the highest degree possible. So from this perspective, this should compel us to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to connect with him because of who he is. We have a deity, we have a Rabb who is maximally loving. He's al-wadud. He is the perfectly loving and his love has no deficiency and flaw. This deity exists. And if his love is so perfect and pure, then we should connect with him. And what's amazing in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know his love is greater than a mother's love. And we, the reason I'm mentioning this, because the greatest experience of love that someone could uh, experience in the dunya is usually from a, love, a mother, because she's quite sacrificial. But a mother's love is nothing compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is compared to Allah. There is nothing like his example, right? So the mother's love, she needs to love. Her love is not completely pure because she gains from loving because it completes her. But when Allah loves, he doesn't gain anything and he doesn't require completion. Allah is as-samad. He is the independent. He is the self-subsisting. He is al-ghani. He is the rich. Yet he loves and he gains nothing by loving. So imagine how pure his love is. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So when you understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, subhanahu wa ta'ala is regards to love you would want to love Allah and how do you love Allah? Allah says in the Quran if you love Allah it says to the Prophet ﷺ, say if you love Allah then follow me meaning following the Prophet ﷺ, and Allah will love you and forgive your sins so do you see this is a totally different dynamic in understanding Allah and this is from the kitab and the sunnah this needs to be arrived, arrived ya Sheikh. but we have sometimes you know we have different discussions and debates you know, postmodernism or this and that and the other. Oh, Allahi, when it comes to the new Muslim, and even me, even myself, being a Muslim in eight, nearly, nearly 20 years now, even with me, nothing beats knowing who Allah is. Nothing beats connecting with Allah, reminding yourself about, Allah, about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and re refining and improving your salah in order to connect with Him. And everything emerges from that. Your life is as different. It changes. It's totally, It's like putting different glasses on and you could see more clearly. And that's why it's very important to revive the spiritual aspects, Ya Sheikh, that why Allah is worthy of worship and why we must connect to him because that's the whole point of the Quran. It was revealed to announce Allah to mankind. And, you know, speaking about Allah's beautiful names and attributes, uh, I was discussing this just the other day, so I was just coming back, since so we're having with the brothers, is, is very interesting because I, I mentioned them many, when it comes to understanding Allah's names and, and having our heart attached to these names. And you mentioned that we do that as an example. And you can think about it with any, any other name as well. And Allah told us in the Quran and a command and an amr. Allah has the beautiful name, so make dua to him through these names. So if we don't uh -huh. understand the names, then we cannot any, any worship Allah through these names. Once we understand the names and their meanings and our hearts become attached naturally right away, we, 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 we turn to Allah with that. And that's something that not just for... And for, for, for non or for new Muslims or non Muslims, also even for ourselves as who have been Muslims all our lives or a, a, a big part of our lives, like, like me and you now, more than half of our lives, alhamdulillah, where we've been Muslims, and he, that is something we're missing as well. And we get into sometimes the, the ideological debates of what, who's right and who's wrong and, 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 the, and the proofs and the adilla, and we forget the true essence of tawheed, and he, that, that truly has the impact. And that when that, when that tawheed impacts our hearts, like impact the heart of the Sahaba, that's when we're going to see you know, the, the true blessings of Islam. And something amazing when you're talking about when Allah, why Allah is, is worthy of worship. I remember one of our, uh, I don't remember if it was in Ireland or and, and we were together in the UK, but you made a little tadabbur about um, uh, Surah Al-Adiyat. You mentioned the, the, the issue of the horse and the sacrifice of the horse for its master, who because he takes care of it, and he's you know, in the middle of the battle now, you know, with, 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 you know, you know, the middle of a battle is back in the day with the horse, but he's still going at full force in order to support his master who, who feeds him, right? So what about us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his, his, his right upon us? So I, I really, you know, I, I thought about that and I, I made more and more to Deborah and then I actually give a khutbah on it later. I mean, I was, you know, and travel in, in, in the Middle East and, and, and that, that's, that's you know, something that the Deborah and that's something also missing is, you know, getting... And the, ourselves as Muslims, our, uh, bringing that into the new Muslim and, and having that 
that are being part of their life to, to reflect on the Quran, to make the Quran part of their life. And inshallah, I think inshallah, you know, gatherings like this and just, you know, just having thoughts out there, inshallah, hopefully inshallah, some of the brothers and sisters uh, who attended tonight, they can be inspired inshallah ta'ala. And uh, like we just plant the seeds. And even something very interesting from the, the, the names and attributes of Allah. I, I gave the course, the 99 names of Allah in South Africa. And the first day we were in, in Durban, uh, it was like a 16 hour course. The first day, it was, uh, the, they said there's a delegation from the Catholic Church. They said, if you don't mind, we want them to attend. I said, of course, yeah, it's really perfect. Let them attend. So at the end, they asked them, you know, what do you think about the course? Because we were going into detail on the meetings. I was, I was bringing, you know, from the brothers and sisters who were there to give us an example of their attachment to a certain name and like in a certain you know, difficulty they faced in life. So it was like implementation of it as well. It was in a, even for me as, as the lecturer, it was really inspiring, you know. So they said, never in the church have we heard something about this, about God, a description in detail like that. That's, that's the blessing we have. But unfortunately, we ourselves are not benefiting. So relating it to others is uh, that, that we're, it's missing as well. And there was, you know, we always talk about planting the seeds. There was a sister there, there was, uh, one of our sisters, may Allah have mercy upon her. Uh, I mean, she, she was, um, you know, diagnosed with cancer and she was, she met this non-Muslim, you know, uh, lady in the same room with her. And she, but even though she's on her deathbed, she's giving her dawah. So she planted the seeds, subhanAllah. So she came to this course as a non-Muslim, you know, through her, through the, 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 the siblings of this uh, sister who passed away, rahimahullah. And she attended the course for two days. So at the, in the second day, she stood up and took her shahad, alhamdulillah. Subhanallah, names. So that, that, that's the impact that this has. And like we said, people are searching for this and missing, unfortunately, inshallah. So, I mean, alhamdulillah, this, this type of gathering, inshallah, hopefully, inshallah, it'll get the, the, the afkar and the ideas flowing, inshallah, so we can hopefully, inshallah, open up the doors for ourselves, first of all, and then for the, you know, for the new Muslims. Inshallah. I mean, I mean. Um, I don't know if there's, if there's any questions, if the brothers and sisters want to send quickly, inshallah, before we, we close out the session. I, I'm going to send the link now, inshallah. For the, I send it to you privately, uh, Hamza, inshallah. And here, here's the YouTube uh, video for anyone who wants to watch the video. I did about, you know, the 14 life lessons that I benefited from my father. And there was one question, if you could answer this, Hamza. Um, Sister Amani Fahmi, she said, what do you say to a person who thinks that life isn't a gift, since he did not choose to exist in the first place. By the way, he is a Muslim. And just to tell you, you know, before you answer it, he's a Muslim. Unfortunately, as Muslims, they've been impacted by these type of ideologies, and he, just as non-Muslims nowadays, you know, uh, in, in the days we live in, unfortunately. So I mean, it's not surprising, unfortunately, to see this even from a Muslim. Yeah, sure. Now, the, the first thing we need to understand is just because you didn't choose something, it doesn't mean it's not a gift. I mean, I don't choose the gifts that people give me. I'm still grateful for them. So I don't think it logically follows that just because you didn't choose life, then somehow it's not a gift. Now, usually with such people, and I have met people like this before, at least one of them, they don't really believe that life is not a gift. Because if you were to tell them, okay, would you choose life over non-life right now? Would you, would you choose non-life over life? They'll say, no, I want to be alive. Well, case in point, that's exactly the point. And obviously, everyone has a different context, so I can't really judge this particular person. He may be going through psychosocial problems. He may have trauma from his upbringing. He may be depressed. Allah Allah knows. But generally speaking, when someone comes with this type of position, generally speaking, they have what you call a gratitude problem and possibly an arrogance problem. So what do I mean by a gratitude problem? Is that they forget about the most basic things that they should be fundamentally grateful for. And it's all about changing that perspective because when you're in when you're in a state of gratitude it's impossible to be in any other state try and be grateful for something and try to be angry try and be grateful for something and try to be sad it is actually really really hard so there's a gratitude problem maybe there's lack of tadabbur on his own life and on the quran on why they should be grateful and on and so on and so forth the other thing that may be happening is a sense of arrogance sometimes people they have this neoliberal understanding of self-ownership that i own myself well, with all due respect, that is ontologically false, meaning that is not the reality of your source, the source of who you are and of your nature. We are slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah created us. We don't own ourselves. Allah owns us, right? And that is a reality. Now, you can make up an ideology and think that you own yourself ontologically, but you don't. And usually when you have that wrong ideology, in, it infects your heart thinking, you know, I, I, I should choose and I own my own self and I could do whatever I want. And that's how, you know, it basically shapes one's disposition. They could come up with certain things like this. So it all depends who the person is. Obviously, I like to, we like to give 
you know, a kind of dower diagnosis, if you like, when we understand all the variables in the context of the person. I don't know what those are right now, but generally speaking, it could be a lack of perspective concerning gratitude. It could be a, an aspect of kibber emanating from this false ideology of individualism that I own myself and it's all about me, you know, and that really affects the, the nafs and increases the idea of that, you know, increases the kind of shahawat, the blame with the blameworthy desires or it also could be in the backdrop they have certain trauma they have certain negative life experiences and what i'd like to advise people and this is very quranic is when people have trauma or negative life experiences they need to stand in the possibility that the meaning they are giving those experiences is not the correct meaning that it could there could be another meaning that is more powerful and as a Muslim, we should try and give the meaning that Allah wants you to give. We should give the meaning that Allah wants you to give. And we see this in the Quran. Look when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Surah Duha, when he tells him about, look, you were orphan and we guided you, and so on and so forth. Allah is giving the empowering meaning to the Prophet's life and some of his traumatic experiences and giving the positive empowering meaning. Also, what about when Allah talks to Musa alayhi salam and talks to him about his life and how he inspired, we inspired your mother and so on and so forth, giving the correct divine meaning to, these, to this trauma. Also, we know the general principle, the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that if Allah loves someone, he would test them. So you see these tests as a means to divine love, depending on how you react to it. That's a fundamentally different meaning. You see, you have an akhirah centric focus and you find and you understand that the akhirah is eternal and this is a finite life and I'm going to be tested and I need to react to these tests appropriately because Jannah is going to be a place and this is based on the hadith that the person who suffered the most in a lifetime, if they dipped in Jannah for a split moment, they will be asked, have you ever suffered? And they would say, wallahi, I've never suffered. So when you put all of these things into place, life is a test, it's a sign of Allah's love. You know, Allah doesn't test someone more than, 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 than they can bear. And this, obviously there's ikhtilaf and understanding of this ayah, but generally speaking is to do with the commands of Allah as well. It's not gonna burden you beyond that you can bear. Um, and also that, you know, the akhirah is the main focus. And even if you suffered, if you're dipped in paradise for a split moment, it's as if you've never suffered. So you have all of these things and it changes the meaning that you give to your trauma. And that's why, and this is even in cognitive psychology, that if we stand in the possibility that the meaning that we're giving our trauma could be the wrong meaning, and that we could basically, and that we could basically give the meaning that Allah wants us to give, that would empower us. Why am I mentioning this? Because sometimes people come across, come out with these statements. They have traumatic experiences in their life, maybe from parenting or life itself, negative experiences, and that affects, and that affects their understanding of the world and how they should react to the world. And that's why my advice to such people is stand in the possibility that the meaning that you're giving to this trauma is not the correct meaning and give the meaning that Allah wants you to give this meaning. And Allah knows best. Just a couple other quick questions inshallah ta'ala before we wrap up. And one of the questions that came in was about the issue of the governments and, and their roles, you know, they're not doing their roles when it comes to you know, supporting da'wah and supporting non-Muslims. And, and this is something, and it, it's an excuse that a lot of times we kind of hold on to. But I, I think, as, as we trying to strive for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this should actually be an encouragement for us to work harder. That's the way I look at it. Now is dua to, and if, if we had a proper you know, Islamic government, we, we, we would be taken care of from Bayt al Mal al Muslimin. We wouldn't have to worry about hustling here and here to survive. Alhamdulillah. But that's not the reality. Does that mean we're not going to give da'wah? No, inshallah, we're going to you know, find means, we're going to work hard, inshallah ta'ala. So also when it comes to finding programs and, and, and it means for the new Muslims, like the ideas we mentioned here tonight, and we have the means to do it, even if, if there's no government who's going to support it as individuals and in communities uh, and, organ and, and even small organizations, in we have the power to do that. Uh, a question now, just a question, if you could mention, they're asking about some resources about, you know, we help them give DAO online. Would you recommend any websites? Uh, I know you have Sapien, maybe you could teach them about, tell them about Sapien so they can, and, but join inshallah the, the webinar that you guys have I, I followed a lot of it. it's really good really beneficial so maybe if you could just tell them a little bit about that please yeah so a really good start as kind of a level one basic approach to giving dawah is the go wrap the, the go wrap methodology that can be found in the ira website they have a free go wrap methodology which is god's existence oneness revelation and prophethood based on the foundations of islam bringing back people back to tawheed there's a really good 
uh, DAO methodology that, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, I was blessed to be part of as well. And you can find that on the IRA website. Uh, you go to their learning platform, register, and it's totally free. Once you've done that as a level one, we have a advanced DAO training course called Awakening the Truth Within. We're actually filming it as we speak. So we're going to hopefully start it tomorrow in a studio. And inshallah, it should be up on our learning platform very soon, which is learn.sapiensinstitute.org. And that'll be more of an advanced level. And we're going to have DAO training courses on the miracle of the Quran called the Eternal Challenge. And we're going to have a course called the Divine Reality, which is dealing with atheism. And that's coming up as well. But as a good starting point, the good place to start is with the IRA website. But the other thing you need to understand, and we've understood this as well, that don't underestimate the power of your of the way you relate to people, your behavior. You know, you should be a person of hilm, a person of forbearance, you know? Because if you look at sort of Fusilat, chapter 41, verse 33 and 34, in verse 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that good, that and, and who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah does righteousness and says, I'm one of the Muslims. That's verse 33. Straight away after this verse, verse 34, what does Allah say? And there's a connection here. Allah says, good and evil are not the same. Repel by that which is better. And between two people, there was hatred. It would turn to intimate friendship. Now, the Arabic word repel is not followed by a direct object, meaning repel anything by that which is better. Yes, sometimes it's translated as repel evil, but that is the kind of uh, in, in certain understanding but the Arabic here is repel by that which is better and repel anything and the ulama say in the tafsir in the tafsir generally that you should repel by what is more beautiful and what is more virtuous be a person of beauty and be a per person of virtue be a person of ethics and when that happens between two people if there's any hatred it will turn to intimate friendship and this was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had hilm. Allah is Al-Halim. And the Prophet Sallallahu had hilm. He had forbearance. And we know this in a famous hadith where the Jewish man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and dragged him by the neck and I believe left the mark. And one of the Sahaba wanted to saw him out. And the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi reacted, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reacted was with hilm, was with forbearance. And he was, you know, soft and approachable and forbearing. And the Jewish person, he became a Muslim because he wanted to test the Prophet ﷺ because this was one of the signs of prophethood, which was forbearance, repelling by that which is more beautiful and by that which is more virtuous. So let me end this example of a story, Chef. There was this brother, and I'm paraphrasing the story, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember its accurate details as well, but the essence is here, which is there was a brother outside Stratford Shopping Center, I think, in London, and he was giving dawah. I believe he had a thobe, he was smiley from what we understand. And then there was so, a, a lady that came up to him and spat on his face. And he started smiling. And he took some tissue, wiped his face, and he gave her tissue because she had some of, of her own dribble or saliva on her face. So she that walks off or runs off. After maybe weeks or months, she comes back and she eventually becomes Muslim. And then after that, Sheikh, they eventually get married. Yeah, no, so he's <laughs> So it's so true so, that uh, if you repel by that which is better, yeah. hatred between two people will turn to intimate friendship. And in this context, it turned into marriage, right? Oh, and this is a true story. And wallahi, you know, sometimes brothers and sisters, we always focus on our rights. And especially as du'at, and especially of us living in the West, yes, you have rights, but give up your rights. Follow the sunnah. The person never chased his rights. He chased the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And he wanted to give the rights to other people Just elevate your game a bit And when someone, you know Technically, someone spits on you You know, can you defend yourself? Can you react in a way that, you know Preserves your rights? Of course you can But what's the higher value? And when we start focusing on the higher values in Islam And following these sunnahs of character and behavior It's going to be a game changer It's going to be an absolute game changer That we are committed to the well-being of all human beings. We are committed to the goodness and the guidance of all human beings. If we relate to human beings in this way, with hilm, just like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then I am telling you, this will be far greater than dawa, direct dawah in terms of, you know, abstract arguments. Because once you win trust, that is a phenomenal thing. Then you could give them tawheed as well. Because remember, remember, the Prophet Sallallahu he was on the mount and he said, if there was an army behind me, would you believe me? 
They said, of course, you are the trustworthy one. And then he reminded them about the message. He told them about the message. That trust needs to be there to a certain element. Obviously, it doesn't happen all the time. But in your context, try and develop that trust, even if you have one minute, one day, one week, one month, or one year. The point is, don't underestimate the character because people would always remember how you made them feel and not necessarily what you said. So imagine you say the right things in the context of you relating to people in a positive way. Total game changer. I know it's difficult because you have to hold the ego. But remember, who are you holding the ego for? Who, what, what? You're pressing down the ego for who? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To seek his face, to seek his reward, to seek his love, to seek his mercy, to seek his forgiveness. It is difficult. Of course it is. But isn't that the struggle? And once you suppress that and you respond with forbearance for the sake of Allah, not reward for the, pe for the people, but for the sake of Allah, I am telling you, it will be a game changer, brothers and sisters. Inshallah. The last question, inshallah, before uh, the links, the brothers asked about the links. Uh, I put Sapien Institute there. That you're going to find the more advanced stuff there. And also myself and the brothers from Sahaba Academy put the links for Ayara as well. You can find the training there uh, and go through the different stages in Shannon Town. The last question, uh, we end with this question, but this question, I think if you look at it, the same type of, uh, whether it's this question or something with the same type of meaning, it's, it's a mindset that many people have that drive them away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the sister is saying, um, Sister uh, Nahla Jaman, she said that, excuse, uh, but how can we convince a poor person living in bad condition that Allah loves him? And they say the same thing as you about the, the mercy of Allah and if Allah was merciful in this. So this this type of, the same analogy, whether it's a different type, of, we're asked in a different way the question. Yes. The issue of evil and you know the bad situation of certain people. It's, it's always coming up. So it's, if you could just give us a summary of how to answer this, because this always, if you're giving da'wah, this is going to come up in all the time. Yeah, if, I mean, if, if, the, if the specific question is, how do you convince a poor person that Allah loves them? Well, the, the first thing you need to do is you need to first get the person to realize the bigger, wider picture, their purpose in life. Their purpose in life is to worship Allah. And if they understand that correctly and they understand that tests and trials in life are a sign of Allah's love, then the way to understand if Allah loves you is the way you react to that, that test. It's simple as that. Allah says in the Quran that he created death and life in order to test you and who is best in conduct. One of the tests is also poverty. How are you reacting to your poverty? So the way I would ask, answer the question is, well, how are you reacting to your poverty? If you're reacting in a way that is based on sabr, that is based on the Quran and Sunnah, that is based on you know, worshipping Allah and so on and so forth, and you're reacting the most appropriate way, then that is a sign of divine love. But if you react by saying, I hate Allah, I don't like this, whatever, and billah, right, whatever, that is going to be a sign that this actually, this test could either be a punishment or it could be a calamity. So, or it could be a way of humbling you even more in order to realize your purpose in life because Allah wants khair for all people. So we're going to get chances. So if you want to realize whatever test it is, it could be poverty, it could be even wealth. You could be tested with wealth itself. You can be tested with, with your spouse. You can be tested with your children. You're going to have multiple tests. To understand if this is a sign of divine love, then check how you responded. How did you respond to that test? And that is something very significant. Now, obviously, it's an easy thing for me to say, Alhamdulillah, I haven't experienced poverty like a lot of millions of people around the world. It, it is a calamity. It is a test. And, you know, I don't want to claim that, you know, I've experienced it and I know how to deal with it. No way. May Allah bless the people. May Allah make it easy for them. But from a Quranic and Sunnah perspective, when it comes to any test as a general principle, you know if it's a sign of divine love by the way of your reaction, how you reacted to it. Is it a way for Allah to bring you closer to his mercy? Or is it a way to remind you about you know, your state and that you need to wake up? Is it a wake up call? Is it a punishment? All of that is understood by your individual reaction. So, you know, there are many people who have experienced poverty and health problems and they've reacted like the muttaqeen, like those who are pious. And that is a sign of divine love. So you know, may Allah make it easy for everybody and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant everybody genital for those and forgive everybody. Ameen. Once again, thank you for accepting our invitation. And hopefully we'll have to have you inshallah in the future once things open up here on the ground in Turkey. As well, inshallah. We gave the, uh, the go wrap. Uh, uh, we did it here with a Sahaba Academy with uh, our, our brother uh, Sheikh Abdurrahim Green. Uh, 
uh, in February. And I've given it several times in Arabic, uh, online and on the ground. MashaAllah. Also in English, I've given on the ground here in, in, in Istanbul as well, alhamdulillah. So hopefully we'll have you, inshallah, on the ground, face to face, inshallah. This is a, a uh, shahada certificate that the brothers have prepared for you from Sahaba Academy. Ah, mashallah. They want it for the any Zahal Khair for uh, lecture tonight and all of the beautiful information. Man, I bless all of you. Jazakallah for the opportunity. I sent it to you, alhamdulillah, on your, on your, on your, uh, so soon shall you have it, inshallah, uh, to keep with you, inshallah. Barakallah. Barakallah, yeah, Sheikh. So we'll see you soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullah. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullah. Falaw qad dukta min halwahu ta'man la atharta ta'allum wajtahatta wa lam yushghil ka anhu hawan muta'un ولا دنيا بزفر فيها فتنتا فلو قد دقت من حلواه طعما لا اثرت التعلم واجتهدت ولم يشغلك عنه هوى مطاعن